Hi, everybody. Good evening. How are we? Um, it's very nice to see you all. It's been a while since we've done one of these. Like, it's been like a month, I think, um, which is really exciting because this is the first one of these that I have done where it's still light outside, which I consider extremely exciting. I should probably introduce myself. So my name's uh, Kieran, and I'm from the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. And tonight we're going to be doing some stargazing from the comfort of our homes, uh, stopping off at various uh, destinations throughout the sky. So um, first of all, like kind of what's on the menu, I guess, tonight is uh, we're going to check out some things that you should just be able to see uh, if you just go out and look at the night sky kind of uh, with your eyes. And then we're also going to have a look at some things that um, if you have like some basic equipment, you might be able to see or things that you can uh, look up for yourself online. So things that like maybe professional astronomers might look at. Um, so to help me with this, I am joined by our resident expert, William. Uh, do you want to say hello, William? Hello. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I debate the title resident expert. Um, keen, keen amateur who happens to get to work at an observatory. You, you work in Edinburgh. You're an expert compared to me. I call you the resident expert. Um, so yeah, you're an astronomer, right, at the Royal Observatory? I am, yeah, although I'm a slightly weird astronomer in that I um, I spend a lot of my time working with building instruments. Um, so I, I do do research, um, but I, I probably most of my time is actually spent as a pet astronomer working with engineers, building cameras and equipment. It's like astronomer slash engineer. Yeah, well, I think the engineers would dispute me even <laughs> dare to call myself that, but-, but A little yeah. bit of everything. Yeah, uh, yeah. Excellent. Um, so as we have a look around the light, night sky, we're going to kind of talk about our favorite objects and things that you can see. And then uh, uh, we'll also talk about some of the work that William does. Um, we're going to be using a program called Stellarium, which is kind of like a, uh, like a planetarium software that you can actually download. It's completely free, which I think is amazing. Um, and you can have a look around on that and have a play around if you want to kind of figure out what you're looking at in the sky. Um, please use the chat to talk to us. Um, we're going to be having a look. So uh, we're going to be talking about like what our favorite night sky objects and memories and things like that are. So uh, we'd love for you to share those and we, we'll, uh, we'll be looking at the chat. If you have any kind of uh, more in-depth questions you want to ask us. Um, so there's also a Q&A button at the bottom. Um, so if you have anything, if you just want to make a comment about what we're talking about, um, at the bottom, there's a chat button, which a lot of you have found to tell us where you're calling in from. And then along that bar, there's also a Q&A button. So if you have like a detailed question, feel free to ask it in there. And towards the end, um, I'll be grilling William with some of those. Uh, all right. So to get us started, and this is kind of a question both for you, William, but also uh, for the chat in general while I pull up. Stellarium is what do you like about stargazing? Why, how did you get into astronomy? Why do you, what's good about the night sky? Uh, so I grew up in West Wales. Um, I know my accent doesn't show it, um, but I, I'm Welsh. Um, and I, um, I lived in a place which was, it was really rural, uh, really, really dark skies. Um, so you go outside and see things a lot more clearly than the place where I now work at an observatory uh, in Edinburgh, where you can't see half so much outside the sea. Um, but um, it's it, it was a, an immediate presence all the time um, to see the, the stars. And I think for me, the, I mean, well, there's thousands of reasons to be excited about the stars, but I one of the basic things I've, I like is that it, it's such a brilliant illustration of this kind of clockwork um, world we live in, uh, that, that the precision with which we can make predictions about the movement of all those little points of light um, is is staggering um, and and kind of I, I hesitate to say that it shows we understand things because there's a, so many things we don't understand but it, 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 it's very reassuring that astron astronomy is one of those really nice bits of science where you can put in some good numbers and say right there's gonna be an eclipse in 500 years time at 3 p.m on this day and, and it will it will happen uh, which is Amazing, and, and I find very. I find I, I find I flip between finding that very sort of comforting that everything works how you expect, and also very sort of disconcerting that you can make these predictions that are so so far in the future, crazily far for for. Yeah. for but but say it's this beautifully uh, sort of 
regulated system like a clock ticking by in in which everything is behaving in very predictable ways now as I say that's on the small scale in which astronomy makes sense when you get onto those vast scales where we actually start getting to you know things we're not going to see uh, obviously but dark matter and dark energy where we actually really don't understand very much at all about our universe but you know it's a it's a it's, it's nice that we do understand the backyard reasonably well yeah i agree so we're starting out here, you might be wondering, what am I looking at? And if maybe you live in Edinburgh, you can recognize it, I'm not sure. So this is the view from the roof of the observatory. So hopefully, I, I made these earlier today, so hopefully they work. Ooh. Oh, sorry. Hey, there we go. So what we're looking at is where uh, the observatory is situated on the south side of Edinburgh. So if you're looking north, you're looking into the center of Edinburgh. So a little bit blurry, but we've got, um, you can see the castle and you can see Arthur's seat. And then if we take a look to our right, we'll have the imaginatively named East Observation Tower because it's on the east side of the building. And then over on the other side, we have uh, the West Observation Tower. So this, um, this is kind of, I think it's from a couple of hours earlier. So yeah, this is from about 4 p.m. Um, so, the sun is still up in the sky, but it's kind of coming down towards the west um, at the moment at about 6 p.m. I think it's set, but the sky is still like light outside. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to kind of show you uh, the path of where we're going to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to advance time because you can't see very many stars during the day. So we're going to go to about nine o'clock. Can, can I point out that, Kieran, you, you, you put that background on Stellarium, and it's, which is an excellent example of nerdery but um it's, it's a good thing about stellarium it's this beautiful program it's free but you can you can stitch in your own pictures you can do things like that uh which which is great you know you get it you can put yourself on the surface of the moon if you like and look at the stars or you can go outside take a picture and then put your own back garden into it which is which is i think is a lovely thing about stellarium yeah so i actually i know a few amateur astronomers that use this to figure out are they going to be able to see this thing from their garden and they've you know put their house in there yeah because, yeah brilliant because, yeah if if i flip back towards the east you'll notice that there's the big dark tower which is kind of in the way so if you get the timing wrong you might miss something um so yeah we've gone to about 9 p.m and we're still we're gonna still face west um that big large one there is the moon which looks really cool at the moment because the moon just has like a a 10 or 20 percent crescent which is actually my my favorite moon <laughs> yeah no, i'd agree and actually you know it's the better time to look at it because you can see all the craters and things along the edges all the yeah, long yeah. shadows of the sunrise or sun, well hang on it's sunrise on the moon we're looking at there isn't it at the moment yeah um effectively oh, if I you were always... standing on the moon the sun would be rising yes <laughs> if you were standing on that edge i think yeah so you get these long shadows and you can see all the craters it's uh, definitely the time to look at it Okay, so we're in the middle of March, so we're going to kind of start off with uh, what are things to see in the sky uh, that you like, kind of in the springtime sky, I guess. It's very weird saying that. It feels like it's been such a long winter. Yes, in so many ways. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very controlled and glance past the, my favourite constellation, which is Orion, which I can just see sitting there in the night sky. Um, so Orion's kind of on its out right it is right. on its way out it's more yeah. of a winter constellation and and yeah. also it's you know i think you've spoken about it before but it, yeah if you go back a couple of months i think we have a, a big long section on orion if you would yeah so but I, I, right. I, will, I will i can't portray it and say that one of my other gun the other constellations is my favorite I, orion's That's glorious in some ways. <laughs> um but um no i think i think the thing which i thought was a, a nice constellation to talk about um uh, this time of year was uh was was leo um uh which is a good oh, spring wait. Time yeah, constellation. A really good choice. Um, so we're going to start out with uh, hopefully ones that um, people can find very, very easily. So these are some of the most famous ones. And we're just going to use these as a kind of signpost for the minute. So the three we're going to look at as a kind of signpost are uh, Cassiopeia over here, which looks like a W, uh, Ursa Minor, which has the North Star in, and then the one that everyone hopefully um, knows about is the Plow which is these seven stars here. And we're gonna use those as a kind of signpost to find Leo. So Leo is basically, if you imagine these looking like a saucepan, which is unfortunately upside down um, most of the time, this time of year. Um, if you imagine going to the bottom of the saucepan and following that, 
you will get to Leo. So Leo is, yeah, we have to tilt our heads over for this one. <laughs> so Leo is here. And if we just zoom out, you can see, yeah, it's kind of basically below the source pan of the plow. So you can imagine, um, yeah. So why Leo? Well, it looks like the thing it's meant to look like, which is, you know, a completely unscientific reason, but you know, it's meant to be a lion, uh, Leo the lion, and 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 it's not bad. Um, which is, yeah, as constellations go, it's fantastic because uh, the vast majority of them look absolutely nothing like the thing they're meant to look like. Um, let's be honest. Um, but but this one's pretty good. Um, so so that's a that's a basic starting point. Um, I it's an easy, relatively easy thing to find um, because of that sort of question mark or backwards question mark you see, um, which forms the head of the lion. Um, it makes it. That's quite an easy thing to identify. Even in the inner city uh, centre, you, you probably should be able to pick out that, that, that shape. Um, and then that lets, you know, if you, obviously, as you say, if you find the plough, think of something dripping out of the bottom of the pan onto the back of the line. Um, then then that would be the, you know, the, the, there's two easy ways to find it, um, which, which, is, which is nice. I think it's a nice thing to be able to find. Um, so there's, oh, there's lots, lots of things to say about Leo, but I mean, I suppose the starting point is it's probably a name which, many people are familiar with um, because it's one of the signs of, of the zodiac um, which I think you've spoken about those a bit before haven't you yeah so I think we did this last month so if I remember right is it here yeah so that's the next sign in the zodiac and then yeah, so we've got cancer there is that the previous one yeah so the zodiac is kind of a line of constellations that kind of stretches this way across the sky and it goes all the way around in a big um big circle all the way around yeah and uh, it's just the route the sun takes but and because of the significance of the sun right you know being lying in those constellations at a certain time during the year they, they've become the, the signs of the zodiac the fact there's actually 13 constellations through which the sun passes um and we only talk about 12 is just uh, uh people trying to make things more symmetrical than they are um but anyway hey ho um Leo is one of those signs, which is why you probably know the name and why people will will say they're uh, a, a, a Leo. Do you say you're a Leo? Does that sound right? Yeah. So yeah. what would that? I think what that means is so like when you say you're a Leo, it basically means the sun is inside that constellation during that month of the year. Ish. Yeah. Ish. Although 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 the, the those were late. Well, I, I, I don't. I, I should be wary of going down astrology routes. Um, but but. The, when those dates were laid down, uh, things have moved a wee bit since then. Um, so so it's every, everyone should shift their star sign by a, by a constellation or two. Um, oh, wow, is it that much? Yeah, yeah. If, if you actually, uh, if you looked at the dates that, that, that people define as being a Leo, um, then then the sun does no, lo no longer lies within the boundary of that constellation anymore. Um, oh, that's during so that date. It's processed by so much. Um, Anyway, that that that's a. I saw a beautiful uh, set of like postcards you could buy in a um, a science museum one time, where it was like, "Here's your real constellation, and you could choose your constellation." Anyway, sorry, that's a, that's a, that's a completely different rant. It's totally no, I, just, I think um, it's really important because like astronomy has arisen from astrology, and I think it's important that like astrology does have these physical meanings. They just don't necessarily mean anything for your life, and I think it's really cool to think about think about them yeah yeah where it comes from no i mean it's, 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 it's a lot of early astronomical research was done was you know people allowed to have the luxury of looking at the stars because people believed that it was something incredibly important for their life to uh, to to know about the location of the planets and the, the sun and the moon relative to these things and the impact that had on their lives which meant that that people almost piggybacked off the back of that to actually do okay i'm being really careful but to do real quantitative research. Um, and, and a lot of our astronomy came from that, um, which is great. Um, it's, you know, yeah. And to, and to some degree, it was a completely different sort of thing. But um, I, was, I feel that if you work in a university and you do research on, a, on stars, you also have to teach the next generation. The, the, the astronomy is the luxury. The teaching is the thing you have to do. I feel like I have to, I want to, but I have to, work with engineers to build cameras and equipment and the research i do is the luxury studying stars is a luxury um it has to we have to say that um and 
I pay for that luxury by 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 building stuff and being a more productive uh, researcher. I suppose. No. Anyway, I'm definitely I'm definitely. I, I said I'd go on ramble. Sorry, this is the topic. <laughs> no, this is great. Um, so actually kind of related to what we were just talking about with the um, the signs of the zodiac. So these are the signs that the sun appears to move through in the sky, but not just the sun. Every object in the solar system appears to move through these constellations because the solar system is this kind of pancake of things all moving in the same um, plane, we call it, which basically means uh, you don't have planets that orbit like up to down and some left to right. They all orbit kind of in the same direction in a circle. So not only do you have that, but you also have every other object in the solar system moving in this same line. And actually at the moment, if you have uh, like a little telescope or some binoculars, there is a very, very small object or solar system object hiding in Leo. Um, I didn't actually realize until I started looking this up that this was one you could see like with backyard equipment because so this, we're going to zoom to it in a minute, but it's here. So kind of around the lion's back leg. And it's a world that um, you might not have heard of, or maybe you have, um, called Vesta. So Vesta is what we call an asteroid. So it lives in um, a big group of basically rocks in between Mars and Jupiter. So this is Vesta. It doesn't look too exciting, but it's really cool because it's the biggest asteroid um, and it's kind of like a failed planet. Uh, so the reason I find this one so exciting, and this is why my, this is my kind of monthly favorite object for this month, it's tiny. It's 325 miles across, which is uh, the surface area of it is um, kind of like the size of uh, a mid-sized country or um, Texas apparently is one of the analogies. So like you can drive across this thing in a couple of days um, or less. And to me, it's amazing that it sits out there millions and millions of miles away. And if you're careful, you can pick it up with some binoculars. And at the moment it's in this quite nice spot because it's right in this constellation of Leo. How bright is it? It's apparently it's like magnitude six, which is like the l- very limit of human eyes. So it's there. Cool. Yeah. So the magnitude scale is a, a weird inheritance from the Greeks, but uh, sort of most of the stars. It was originally, I think, zero to six. The Greeks define it as, or was it one to six? I think. I think it was one to six, and it's basically yeah. like one's the brightest, six is the dimmest of just the stars you can see. And 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 then we've just extrapolated out that scale. So you've got planets which are negative numbers, which are brighter. Lower the number, the brighter. Um, and then you've got the sun, which is like minus twenty six or something stupid. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got Hubble, which is looking at things which are in the in the twenties. Um, yeah, twenties. Yeah, but it, uh, uh, Stellarium will tell you that as well. I think you've turned it off at the moment, but but yeah, you click on the object. You can you can so so it gives you a guide an idea. It's a really useful thing. So so as you say, if if it, if it's at around six ish, um, yeah. then that it, to six in theory, if you're in a really dark place and you had really good eyesight, you could just about make out a six match object. But it'd be it, you really want to get a pair of binoculars on it. But anything yeah. visual than six, is bit, yeah, which is a little too dim for your eyes. Um, so, so that's a, there's a useful number to remember when 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 going stargazing, planning what you're trying to go and look at. You see, especially something like Stellarium, there's a danger that you can. I mean, it's wonderful. I love Stellarium, but you can um, you see something, you go, oh great, I'll go and have a look at that, and then you actually look at the magnitude, and it's magnitude nine, and if it's magnitude nine, you you you, you really need a telescope. Um, I mean, you might get something with the really good binoculars, a good dark place, but yeah. So I think that's definitely a useful thing to think about is having this. Um this magnitude scale and like if you are gonna have a look up at some of these things usually up to about four is something you'll see in like the suburbs so unless you live somewhere really rural i wouldn't look for anything dimmer than four that's cool that's best to say though i didn't know that if you, I'm glad, i thought you were gonna ask me if i knew what was there I don't think no, no, no. <laughs> um so um yeah i mean I, I, I should say i mean it's just a point that you know i i am I'm an astronomer in theory, um, you know, and that's my job. But but I think it's always worth remembering that professional astronomers often um, 
there can be a disconnect with the night sky. You can get professional astronomers who who were considerably better professional astronomers than, uh, than me, um, who might not be able to tell you where the plough is because they don't need to know because do our, you could say they're more astrophysicists rather than astronomers. But but there has you know historically the the night sky and the research would have been very you know looking at the night sky would have been very closely connected. A lot of the research we do now is 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 looking at data from a telescope on on a computer screen um, or even looking at the maths behind what's going on in the sky and 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 the two have become somewhat decoupled you, you don't necessarily need to know anything about the night sky um to actually be a very good astronomer um which is which is bizarre and so it's so actually often a lot of and i put it loosely amateur astronomers um will probably be able to tell you far more about the night sky and know far more about what what, what you know what i'm saying now i'm sure there are some amateur astronomers who are listening to this who probably know far far more about the night sky than i will ever learn um which I think is always worth remembering. Um, yeah, one of the nice things about astronomy. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> accessible. Um, the... Yeah. Okay. So we love Leo because it's a zodiac constellation. It's quite easy to see. It kind of looks like a lion. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, Vesta's inside. So it's Vesta's kind inside. of inside. And um, I'd, I'd add that the so one of the other things which I point out easy thing to find is Regulus, which is the brightest star in Leo, um, which is this one here, um, and that is. Um, it's actually one of the brightest stars, and I think it's top twenty brightest stars in the sky. So it's a you know that that is one you're going to be able to see unless you're in a really really light polluted area. Um, it's well, actually, it's not a single star. It's a multiple system um, with uh, I think I think it's four different stars in the system, um, but it's it's not one star. But, but but there's one dominant star, which is the star which you, you know which most of the light is coming from, um, mm -hmm. and that is a, 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 a blue star um so it's a a young bright blue blue star um so these are the sort of things i research so when i when i'm not building instruments i um, research massive stars um so i'm interested in the things which are um tens of times the size of the sun um so so there's a very simplistic uh categorization for different types of stars um but if we talk about massive stars uh we think about the way they'll die so our sun is a pretty sort of average kind of star, which is probably not a surprise. Um, it is um, it's going to end its life um, in a fairly undramatic way. I mean, depending how you think about it, I mean, it, it will probably shed lots of material, which will probably destroy the Earth, um, which is depressing. But but it's not it's not a dramatic supernova big explosion, which which is the sort of exciting death for a star. Um, it will sort of shed its outer layers and you'll end up with something called a white dwarf, which is a, um, a sort of hot, dense remnant. Um, if stars are big enough, then they will um, they will go supernova so that, that the star sort of collapses in on itself. You get this kind of like bouncing out of material um, and, and you get this huge explosion. Um, so if it can do that, it's called a massive star. So if it has a core collapse supernova as its eventual fate, we count as massive stars. Now, massive stars are, um, say they are, they're bigger, they're hotter, um, they burn through their fuel really quickly. Um, and because they're hotter, they're bluer. Um, so one of the nice things, another thing I think, which is really nice about um, Regulus and as an example, it's, it's a quite a blue star, you can see it quite clearly, but, but it's a nice thing to go and try and do in the night sky. I'm gonna to come to it in another, another object we talk about in a minute, um, but you can see the colors of the stars. Um, and the colors of the stars tell you something about the temperature of the stars. And that is astronomy 101. Like, like the, um, we have learned so much um, about astronomy and about st st star, uh, the physics of stars um, by their color. Um, it's because it's one of the few things we can measure um, easily. You can measure how blue or red a star is. It gives you something about the color, it gives you something about the temperature. So how does that, how do those two things link together? Um, why? Why would a blue star always be hotter or colder than a red star? Um, so it's about the way the light is emitted. Um, so there's a property called um, black body radiation, um, I, I, it, and it and it the hotter an object, the the higher energy light it gives off, um, and the the higher energy light is 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 bluer than um, than 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 uh, lower energy light. Uh, sorry, that's not said that very well at all. Um, 
I mean, the thing we always think about, it's, it's a stupid thing to say, but, you know, in, in our everyday lives, we're used to seeing this sort of thing of uh, red being hot, um, blue being cold. It's the opposite in, in physics. And this is physics. This is not astronomy. This is a physics thing. If you take a piece of metal and you stick it in a hot fire or in a furnace, you would see it get hotter and start to glow red. And that's kind of something which people can probably visualize. If you keep heating it, it would get hotter and hotter until it started glowing white. And, and, and if you kept heating it, it would probably have melted. But if you kept heating it, it would start glowing blue. And if you kept going, it would actually start glowing in the ultraviolet. Now, okay, in, in reality, a piece of steel or whatever would melt before it reached that. But the, the, the wavelength of light it emits is directly coupled to its temperature. So if it's cool, it emits you know, if it's very cool, it will emit something that will emit radio waves and, and, and everything shifts up and then you get red infrared stuff. We are sitting glowing in the infrared, something our eyes can't see, but we are glowing right now. If you heated us up, we would melt, but we would go to a red point and we would then go to a blue point. Any, any piece of physics does that. And a star is just a beautiful piece of, um, of physics because you can, it's a, well, it's a real, it's a real black body, which is something we don't see uh, on Earth very easily. Anyway, that, that, yeah, that's probably sorry more than you. So, so effect, effectively, if I understand this right, um, the way to think about this is not to think about um, red like fire. It's more red like if you heat something up like a piece of metal, um, yeah. Yeah. where like it starts to glow red first before it glows any other color, and yes. then as you up, it goes sort of. I guess like yellow and then white and then would go blue if you could get it hot enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. And you can see it in the stars. You can see you can see these red and blue stars. If you see a red star, it's cooler. If you see a, a blue star, it's hotter. And that's it's it's the, it, the you know it's just an extra layer of no. So if you remember nothing else, remember that that next time you go outside, you see a red star, you can say, oh, that's that's a cold star. And then you get an exciting thing. Generally, that means it's an older star as well. But that's, that's so. Why does that mean it's an older star? What does how does age fold into um, so it generally um, it, it's that the, the the stars will get redder as they get older because they cool down effectively. Um, there are slight caveats on that, um, but um, what is a rule of a rule of thumb? As a rule of thumb, and, but, but but the other rule is so stars which are older are often redder. Stars which are bright and blue are definitely young because they don't last very long. So our sun has been sitting here for about four and a half billion years. It'll probably sit here for another, well, probably the same length of time, maybe a little bit longer again. So it will have a sort of, I don't know, 10 billion year lifetime, um, which is preposterous, but it's about 10 million years. Some of these bright blue stars will last for maybe 100 million years. If it's a really bright one, it might be only 5 million years. If it's a really big star, um, you have to think that these things are huge. They are are greedy and they just churn through their fuel. So they start off with much more fuel, but they use it so quickly that they, they, they go out quickly, uh, they die quickly. So, so if it's blue, it's young. And that's, yeah, remember that, that's an easy thing. You, know, you can see it, you can see it. Actually, I think we have um, some examples. So Regulus is a good example, but one of my favorite examples, um, oh, I think that's the wrong one. I don't wanna go there. So if we jump back away from Leo for a minute and back to the plow, um, and I think it's a little early in the night to see what I want to show. So I'm going to advance time. Fast forward time. It's so nice. It's so nice to not have to wait for two hours. I can just, yeah. we're going to move from 9 p.m. and we're going to move to around midnight. So this is a little late, but the only reason I'm moving is because uh, the hills are in the way. So you might get lucky. You might be able to see this um, yourself. So where I want to look is kind of, so for reference, here's the plow. And you'll remember Leo was down below the kind of saucepan. So Leo's here. And amateur astronomers always talk about this. And I don't, I never really, it's one of those things that sticks in my head, but I don't really know what it means. So um, lots of amateur astronomers say this thing, which is arc to arc torus, which basically means if you take the curved, handle of the saucepan and you follow it you end up at a really bright star here and this is Arcturus so Arcturus is a red star so it's a really good example and then the second part which is the part I find even more confusing and don't really remember is speed to spiker which basically means once you hit the star on this curve you then go in a straight line 
and you end up here. And this is Spiker. So, yeah. Oh, I can't. This guy. So these are kind of really, I guess, really good examples of what you're saying. So you'll notice I, I left the magnitudes on. So this is a really bright star. It's a zero magnitude star. So one of the brightest in the sky. And it really then, is actually, and you'll see it low in the sky and it, as it's rising because you can see it's quite low in the sky here, and, and it's kind of it looks quite it can look quite odd. It's like this really bright thing. Um, people might often think it's a planet, um, but yeah, it's it's, it's a, so Arcturus is. Um, it's a, a red giant, so it's a kind of a, it's a future glimpse of what our sun will look like. Um, it's 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 nearing the end of its life. Well, it's, it's further along its life than our sun. Um, it's not that near the end of its life. You know, it's not going to go supernova tomorrow. It's probably got a, a billion years to run. Um, but it's it is uh, it is it is more evolved and it is redder, and you can see it's red in the sky, which is lovely. So it's quite a bit cooler than our sun as a consequence. Um, and yeah, I think it's I think it's nice to point out that it's it's part of uh, the constellation of Booties, which you can see there. Um, and again, this one where like you say this, this doesn't work so well. You see, that's meant to be a, a, a herdsman, um, so it's a person. Uh, but I, I really struggle personally. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll give you the legs and the kind of yeah, body. ish. I don't think it's great. No, um, but you can see that sort of those one two three four five six seven stars kind of do form a, a sort of relatively easy to find six stars can't count a pattern on the sky um of the body is quite easy to find and and then i think it's quite nice is is it's kind of the idea is he's the he's the herdsman and he's herding the bears across the skies because he's always following the the the, the, the plow and the big bear and then the zersa major so so the idea is he's sort of links with those bears if you go into the mythology of it all which is a whole novel world which i'm even less very about. interested to meet the shepherd that herds Heads bears. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, brave, brave shepherd. Yeah, it's true. Actually, you're right. Um, yeah, it's yeah, so, it's, it's, it's two bears self. and a lion in his in his flock, he's which a braver, is braver, yeah. braver shepherd than I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then he said, and Spiker again is really blue. So Spiker is is actually even more of a massive star than um, even younger, larger star than than than, than Regulus. Um, the, so the bright, the blue one in, in Leo, so another blue object to look for. And again, it's a binary system. So it's two, that one's two, two bright stars, pretty, pretty even mass. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of other reason why I want to point out some of these objects is, is that's the particular area of research I'm interested in is, is how the impact of the so binary, two stars close together, how they, um, how that affects the evolution of the stars. Um, so at risk of, establishing a pattern from two things. So we talked about uh, Regulus, which is here a minute ago, and you said that that was, was it four stars? I think, I think, it's, I think it's two pairs. So two pairs, stars, I think, yeah. So there seems to be a group here around this really bright young star. And then again with Spiker, there seems to be a, a group of stars, at least two. So is there something to that? Is there something to... Do young stars seem to move in groups, or am I just making a pattern out of nothing? No, you're, you're, yeah, yeah, exactly that. Um, so they, they, a lot of stars are in 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 pairs or in groups, um, but it does seem to be more common with the more massive stars. Um, and and actually, when we think about it, it's probably not a surprise because that's telling us something about the way they form. Um, so our our we be, we. Well, we have, I was going to say we believe, but actually, I think there is increasingly good evidence from new new observations that 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 stars um, form from collapsing clouds of gas and dust. Um, so the sort of things you see in, in Orion's belt um, to bring it back to Orion, um, and as the, the that cloud of gas and dust collapses in, the the, the density builds up so so it gets more and more mass in a smaller space and 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 eventually the the pressure of the the, the weight of that cloud um, allows fusion reactions to occur and a star is is formed um, now the size of the star you get left with depends on how dense that original cloud is so a bigger cloud a denser cloud will give you a bigger star very simplistically but it also therefore it's maybe not surprising that some of those regions are very dense and you actually can get um, multiple systems. You've got all this material um, in a relatively in a relatively small 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 space, an astronomically small space, um, and and so you might be more likely to get two 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 or more stars. Um, what 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 is 
not so well understood is whether um, you get these things forming as individual pockets separately. So, you, so imagine your big cloud of gas and dust. It's a big, huge expanse, and you can see some of these things on the night sky. Um, they they collapse in and they form stars in little pockets. Do you get two pockets which form? And because it's a big dense cloud, will some of them get pulled together and they end up going around each other for eternity? Or do you get one pocket which is so dense that it kind of splits in two within itself? So it's a bit like having, um, I can't think of the right words, but you know, a twin which is, um, you can get twins where, where they're identical twins because they're one cell which is split, or twins which are, are, are t- is that hetero? I think, is it fraternal? Oh yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, but you know what I mean? You can either have twins, because you can have a girl and boy who are twins. Or twins that are siblings, but they're not identical. Exactly. Um, so you can get to, so what's, what's the mechanism behind storm forming the massive stars? And, and you would find different, um, different competing um, theories in the literature right now on, on, on which is the most common mechanism. Um, and, 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 and then you get into the really interesting thing that if you get the really big stars, which are like 100 times the size of our sun, and we can't really see any of those here, but we're going to try and find some in a minute. Um, they... Um, some of those we theoretically shouldn't exist. They clearly do, um, but we don't understand how you form those. And it could be that they are in regions where things are so dense that the siblings have um, merged. Um, so they have they have formed as separate things and then and then collided together to form an even bigger star, um, which is. So what kind of time scale does that happen over? Because is this like as they're born? Yeah, as they're born. Well, yeah, as they're born. But but it's, um, and we're talking millions millions of years for the formation of the, the, the collapse. Um, but but in, say in astronomy, that's, that, that is quick. That is, that is a short time frame. Our sun would take longer. The, again, it's um, the bigger the, the sorry, the, the, the bigger the star, the kind of the denser the region, the more quick the reaction, not reaction, but the quicker the collapse of the cloud because the cloud is bigger and heavier to start with. Um, our sun would take many millions of years to form. Um, and then, you know, because of that, our sun, you mentioned earlier on this pancake when everything lies in. Well, that's because that cloud collapsed. And if you take a gas of material, a thing of material which is swirling, it will eventually over time flatten uh, because of uh, the conservation angular momentum. It kind of collapses, which you've got to get a disk um, and it can form planets. But that takes millions of years. These stars, some of these really bright stars, they don't have time to form planets. Um, so they don't have planets around them. Um, which is so a shame because they, yeah, sorry, no. Oh, sorry, sorry, I was going to say, so if we were going to look for life, actually, these blue stars that you're really interested in would be terrible. Terrible. And yeah. also, we're not sure whether you could easily form planets around multiple systems. Um, it might be that the, 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 I mean, there are some, there's some evidence of that, but, but, but in general, it's really easier to form planets around a single star. So the fact that we live around a planet of a single star is probably uh, an evolutionary necessity potentially that, that, that in order to form the planet you need a stable system oh that's really interesting to think about then that the sun likely never had a partner no, no. Oh, actually that's a, that's a good point can can you lose partners do you stay um, in your binary together to forever you'd need well so you to lose them during the lifetime of the star you'd need some 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 serious uh disruption so you'd have, you know, in order, if we were in, you've had two stars going around each other, in order to kick them out of an orbit, you'd need something even bigger to come in. And in a dense region, it's possible in the middle of a cluster. But um, what's more common, um, and again, is something which would, is particularly interesting um, to sort of understand the formation, is, is that one, you have two stars, one of them eventually will go supernova, because, because one will run out of, if in the massive star scenario, one will go supernova. And you've got these two things going around, two masses, nicely constrained, like the sun and the earth. And if the sun suddenly went poof, and all the mass distributed, the earth would just go flying off at incredibly high speed um, in the direction it's currently going. And, and so we, we have seen some evidence of this in dense regions, that some massive stars which seem to be running away from the region at very high speed. Um, oh, wow. which is, um, kind of, tell, yeah, it's exciting dynamics. That's incredible. So actually, one thing I just wanted to show, because I really like the story kind of related to these binaries, is this star here. So the middle of the, oh, I need to do my drawing. So the middle of the plow's handle, and this star is called Mizar. And I don't know whether the story is true, I don't know if you know, um, that this was used as an eye test for Roman soldiers. Have you heard this one? I'd, I'd heard this in relation to um, Pleiades, that, that it was used. Yeah, to I think it, I, Yeah. I have a suspicion it's not true, but I really like the story anyway. So the story is that 
either this this star Mizar or um, the Pleiades or similar things. So this is another one of these stars. So this one is a binary. So if we zoom in here, you can see its friend. So there's Mizar, and it has a friend, Alcor. And these are um, actually a binary. If you have good eyes, you can see them with the naked eye. So um, usually younger people can actually tell that these are two separate stars. And as you get older, they kind of merge into one as you need glasses and things. Um, so the story is that in the Roman army or the Greek army or various different armies, um, this was how they tested if you would become a foot soldier or an archer. So if you had really good eyes and you could uh, differentiate these two stars, you would become an archer or you would become a sort of foot soldier. And again, I don't think it's a true one, but I just really like the story. And I really like, there's a, like, a, a sort of coda to the story, which is Mizar and Alcor have more stars in their group. And so if we go further in on Mizar, um, you actually get the third one. So you have to go really close in. Um, but actually uh, we think there's anywhere up to six stars in this system, whatever you want to call it. Um, which to me is incredible because I really love the idea of this guy with like really, really good eyes insisting that there were three and then all thinking he's a liar because there's no way they ever would have been able to tell. And I, I doubt that ever happened. I just like the idea of it. No, I agree. I agree. I, I, I didn't realize it was, I, I thought it was just a double until the other day when we were prepping, talk, talking about this. I had, I had yeah, yeah. So, um, amazing six of them. It's been known to be a triple since about the 1700s, like post telescope invention. Yeah. But then as recently, I think it's like 2014, they found evidence that for the sixth star in this system, which is crazy to me that yeah. this is something people have stared about, stared at for tens of thousands of years, and it's still got these like little secrets in, which I think oh. is really the, 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 I mean, this is the thing. I mean, our our our, our telescopes are still, you know, they're still so limited, you know, in what we can do. I mean, they're amazing pieces of kit, but but we will we will continue, you know, if if if, if we were still funded for more generations to build telescopes, we will continue to find things out. Um, you know, all the knowledge we're finding about um, the planets going around these systems, which so, you know, we, we didn't have a single exoplanet, so a different planet in a different system 20, 25 years ago. We've now got thousands, um, and it seems to be a very common thing, but, but, but that's a whole new area of astronomy, which has opened up, which wasn't even there before. Um, and there'll be similar, I'm sure there'll be similar revelations. Well, that's quite a, a, a huge revelation. Not revelation, it wasn't a surprise at all, but a huge new area. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So there was one last thing I wanted to show, or wanted you to show off which is something that actually you can't see from the night sky in the UK so in the UK uh, you probably know we're in the northern hemisphere so we only actually get half of the sky and yeah like it varies over time um, throughout the year but there's bits of the sky that you can never ever see because basically they're above the kind of south pole or above the very southern half of the globe so if you actually if you travel to say Australia or whatever um, these are bits of the sky that you will have never seen before, which I think is really exciting. And you got me to pick out one of them. I just need to remember how to fly there. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just yeah, I'll just tell on that that the yeah, I mean it is a it is a cruel bit of fate that we you know us, that, that if you're living here in, in, in the northern hemisphere, you just can't ever see the galactic center. Um, and and if you do get to go traveling to a to a distant you no know, to a to a to a southern hemisphere site and you get to go to a remote place, um, it, you know if there's, if there's half a chance to do it, absolutely go and do it. Um, it does depend on the time of year. Certain times of the year obviously are better than others. So that's another thing you could find out easily on Solarium. Um, but when the galactic center, so the middle of our galaxy, is up above your head, I mean, on a in a dark place, it is it's it's. An, stargazing like you've never seen in, in, in the UK is one there's a very nice little bit of theming here which is if you if you find Leo in the sky and if you kind of take the point of the question mark but you kind of diagonal off a little bit so we're going to go straight down here and if you stared at the floor which I don't recommend you would actually be staring at what we're going to go to which is the I didn't know that that's nice I like that yeah so this is the large Magellanic cloud 
So first of all, what's a what's a Magellanic cloud before we get into the details? Um, so we have two dwarf galaxies going around our own galaxy. So so our galaxy, hundreds of billions of stars. Um, that number is not well known, which you think it should be, but it really isn't. Um, all generally lying in a big disk. Um, there are two l relatively large clumps of stars. I mean, one's about a hundredth the mass of our galaxy. No, a thousandth the mass of our galaxy. It was about 10,000th the mass of our galaxy. They're quite small, but still thousands, million, millions of stars, which orbit our galaxy. Eventually, they'll get absorbed by our galaxy in, in, in billions of years. Um, but they are visible when you're in the southern hemisphere. Again, if you get to the southern hemisphere, you can see them if, in tens of the time of the year, but they are they look like clouds in the sky because they they look like this hazy patch and they're almost one of those things often with stargazing it's better not to look directly at things you, you, you your peripheral vision is more sensitive to faint objects so if you look directly at something you don't see it quite as well um which is an evolutionary trick i guess um so this patch of sky is actually a different galaxy different yes a different galaxy i mean yeah you could argue it's kind of within the environ so so much of our uh, milky way that it, it's kind of some, another astronomer in another uh, galaxy would probably look at it and see them as almost, well, almost as one. Um, it's like having a little village on the outskirts of the city. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and eventually the village, I mean, the slight difference is the, the village gradually gets pulled into the, into the, into the city. It's not the city grows, it's the village just gets dragged in. Um, what would that be in Edinburgh? In Edinburgh, that would be like, I don't know, Cramond or something. Yeah, no, we're probably a bit more distinct than that. It's probably more like Livingston. It, it's it's sorry this is completely irrelevant to people in another part of the world um but, but we, we are talking about you know th there's this proper green belt between between you and this village it's it's not it's not yet subsumed at all they, it is it is a distinct entity clearly well-defined distinct body of stars um oh, yeah um but um the, the 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 particular bit of interest here is that um that where you just put your mouse um, is 30 Doradus. Um, this is a region where there's massive star formation um, happening in, re you know, in real time, but also within the last few million years. Um, and this is the largest group of massive stars in the local universe. So if you look at all the kind of uh, the nearest tens, possibly even the nearest hundreds of galaxies. Oh, the moon is really good at the moment um, to the west. Um, if you if you if you look at within that region, the nearest tens of galaxies, then then the, the um, this is the largest star region. Sorry, my daughter is crying quite loudly in the background. I don't know if you can hear. Oh. Um, um, the um, and 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 so it it kind it's called the Tarantula Nebula. Um, Thirty Dorado has got lots of different names, but you can kind of see the sort of spidery legs bits ish. Um, but in this region, then this is a region which actually I've studied a lot. Um, there's there's thousands of massive stars. So think of the Spica or Regulus. There's thousands of those within just within that patch of sky. Um, and to give you an idea of the density we're talking about, and I think this is always the thing to think about, is that that central region. So um, you can kind of see the lighter pink. Uh, I can kind of hear. Yeah, if, if, you, if you go in a little bit tighter, um, no yes, yeah, so probably. Uh, so maybe a, a fifth of that diameter. So really the quite central core. Oh, so like, based, unfortunately, the resolution of the image isn't great. Go and Google. Go and Google the Tarantula Nebula. It's stunning. Um, that central region, so the central, okay. but yeah, yeah, that's that sort of area, um, is about the same size as the distance from our sun to the next sun, which is about uh, four point two light years. It's kind of the sun um, will be here, and then the Alpha Centauri would be something. Like I think that. so. Possibly even slightly closer. I think actually. No, 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 probably about right. I'm getting confused my past X and things. Yeah, about, about that sort of scale. That sort of scale. Yeah. Within that region, there are you know, a thousand massive stars. So you think of our bit of a space, our bit of backyard, where it's, you know, there's, there's nothing in, in, in between us and the next nearest star. I mean, obviously, there are a few chunks of ice and some wandering asteroids and so on, but um, nothing substantial. There are literally, if you were standing on a planet, although the planets couldn't exist for the, what I said before, in that region, your sky would be filled with these. <laughs> ultraviolet glowing uh bright stars um it would be an amazing place to visit apart from that you never have night time sorry you basically never have night time oh i don't i don't think you would i i, I I've, I've, yeah I've, I've always wanted I've, I've always meant to do this calculation i've never actually done it of actually how bright would it be in terms of like comparable to our sun but well, there's your homework um, 
<laughs> yeah, I should do it. Or someone, someone, someone's like, go and do it. Come back and tell us. Um, it would be very bright. But it would be bright in the ultraviolet because these things are so hot. They're like 30,000 degree stars. Most of the light they emit is, 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 is pushed. You know, you've gone from red to blue to ultraviolet. Um, and in fact, it, say you would you'd probably get some horrible, uh, you know, you'd die of cancer because you'd be bombarded with ultraviolet radiation. But it would be a hell of a way to go. Um, so on that note, I'm going to transition to questions because I think that's a good place to leave it. So if you're ever in the Southern Hemisphere, Magellanic Cloud, a thing to look out for. These are these regions of really, really intense star formation. But for now, we're going to travel back to sunny Scotland. You can see the clouds with your eyes. You, um, to for something like Virgilardus, you would you would definitely want some binoculars or really a telescope to, to, to see any kind of hint of uh, detail there. Um, so, but, but Yeah, aren't they called Magellanic? Because they're named for Magellan, right? Who was a, yeah. an explorer yeah. so from a ship. Dutch uh, guy, first guy to go around the um, uh, South America, um, and obviously being a you know white European, they get named after him. Um, no. Although I'm pretty sure that other people were quite aware of them for quite a lot longer. But anyway, hey ho, there we are. So All right, Magellan cloud, small Magellan cloud. Amazing. I'm going to transition to some to some questions because we have some really good ones actually. Um, so first one, this is actually. This person prefaces this by, I know it's a silly question. I actually think this is a great question. Um, how do you know the sun is 4 billion years old? How do you age a star? Um, so some of it is, 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 is theoretical. Um, so so you, can, you can kind of, um, we know how big it is. You know how uh, the rate at which it burns through material. Um, and you can therefore extrapolate um, back to where it would have been at age zero. Um, uh, an, another, another part, a lot of what we do in astronomy is learning through um, cross-referencing of other objects. So you, we look for the age of other regions and we, 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 can, we can look at um, how our sun fits into other patches of sky through which we might have another calibration. And then some of it is also through kind of... Um, Looking at elemental abundances, uh, so so the, so the ratios of different species in the in 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 the star give you some indication of age as well. Um, so this for, is this if I remember right? So a really young star, you'd expect to basically only have hydrogen and helium in. And uh, it, or... Yeah, well, that's yeah. That's some some degree that's generational as well. Um, but 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 yeah, it's um, it, yeah, it's quite. It is a mixture of observation and theory, so it it it, it works out from um, comparison with other objects as well. Um, this is why I think this is a great, it's actually, a great question because I I'm struggling to answer it properly. <laughs> um, <laughs> it says it in my textbook. Of course, it's four billion years old. Why are you asking? God, dear. yeah. You look it up on Wikipedia. That's how you know. <laughs> All right. So number two, I think this is a really good one too because this is something I definitely had as a question which is so in our analogy of heating a piece of metal up why does it go red kind of yellow white why doesn't it ever go green oh um oh it that's does it does rainbow. it does it to... that's a nice question to be asked um it does uh it, it's we just wouldn't see the green as a distinct color um it doesn't um it doesn't give out light a very narrow window. Um, so um, what's the best analogy? But if, but if you think of like, um, if you think of the different colors as being notes on a piano, you, we're not playing one note at a time, right? So, so if you've got a, a, an octave of notes, you've got eight notes and you've got blue at one end and red at the other end and green is right in the middle, um, where the, the star kind of, if you imagine taking your hand and whacking on the piano, <laughs> as it gets hotter, it moves through those notes, right? So, so at the start of the process, or if you start, if you were heating something up, it would start where you would, you would, you would hit those notes, and you, you'd be getting just the red end, All right? This, this is a rubbish analogy um, <laughs> because I'm going to go along, but it, it, you'd just see the red end. And if you imagine kind of going through, you'd get to the other, but you just see the blue. When you're in the middle, in the green, you whack those notes, you hit all the notes at once. And our sun 
is actually green. So the peak of emission for our sun is green, but it also gives off light, which is on either side of green. And so you get this broader brush and, and therefore you don't hear the individual note. And it's the same thing. Imagine, so in, so in my stupid piano analogy, what we're saying is that actually there's notes on either side of your octave, right? So there's, there's, there's hundreds of notes, but there's only eight notes you can only ever hear. So someone's bashing away down at the, the, the highest end of the notes. And as they come down, you just hear that one note and you'd hear one note just as it becomes audible. Keep going down, you'd get this point in the middle where you hear all this crash of notes, you hear everything. And that's what we see when we see the sun. You get this white rush of, of light because all the visible light is there. And then as you keep going down again, you'd get the point where you only see here with the last note, which is the red. That's not necessarily the best way of talking about it, but, 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 but I hope that kind of makes sense. So maybe I can check I've got this right in my head as well. So the green, green color in the sun is actually the most common, yep. but only just. So there's still lots of red, there's still lots of blue. And so Absolutely. basically it looks white, yeah, very pale green, yellow. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and um, you know, I think the, why has our eye, our eye evolved to, to be, be visible? So, so, so what we define as visible is centered around green, around the middle. Um, well, it probably, it's probably no coincidence. I know there are other animals which have slightly different spectrums, so it's not quite that simple, but, but there is probably an element of truth that if you grew up around a different star, your eyes might have evolved to, to, to be sensitive in the middle of a different color, um, which is a bizarre, and lovely thought. Sorry, uh, that piano thing. I don't know. Uh, that was that, that <laughs> no, made like more it... sense in my head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how all analogies happen. <laughs> um, all right. So one very very quick final one, which is, um, are there any Magellanic clouds in the Northern Hemisphere that we can see? Uh, no, not really. Um, I mean, the best thing is Orion's Belt. Uh, it's a completely different type of phenomenon, um, not Orion's Belt, but the, 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 sword, the sword. So go and see the, the, um, the haze of, um, of, of, of the star formation region in Orion. Um, pretty much every other thing you will look at with your eyes is, is, um, a star, uh, Orion's belt, of belt, but the sword. So the, the star formation region is a um, is a, is a patch of cloud, a cloud of gas and dust. The only other caveat, as well, is, is Andromeda. Um, so Andromeda is, is is the galaxy which is visible, and that's a completely different galaxy. Um, but it's so faint compared to Magellan clouds. You've got, you, you you can see it in a dark place. You definitely can see it. Um, but yeah, there's Orion's belt. Um, everything yeah. else you see in the night skies is is, is a star, really. Um, yeah, so something around here, be able to see a fuzzy kind of patch just below. Yeah. His... What's the and time? that would be, yeah, that would be the closest I think. Um, can, oh. I, can I just say Sirius is minus one? I think, by the way, uh, just to pick up. I can see another question. Oh, was that? I'm allowed to say that Sirius is minus one, and yes, all the stars we're looking at are relatively nearby. Um, they're 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 within our region. The, the Milky Way body main bulb is further away. Yeah, so I think the most, I think if I remember right, the most distant star we can see is something like 500 light years or so. Yeah, okay, 000. I don't know. Yeah. And yeah. um, for reference, the Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. So we're actually looking in a really local region when you're just looking at your eyes. Yeah, it's woods for trees sort of issue. You know, you, you are just seeing the, the, the nearby bright, big, big, tall trees near you, um, but there's a whole blinking great big forest further away. Amazing, thank you. So I'm afraid that is our time. So thank you so much, Will, for uh, hanging out with us. Um, I'll just share the... Sorry, it was a bit of a ramble. <laughs> oh no, ramble is good. Ramble is exactly uh, what we're here for. Um, yeah, so thank you guys so much. So uh, just gonna signpost you to a couple of things. So. Um, follow us on Twitter at Royal Obs. There's uh, lots of events like this happening. Um, if, if you enjoyed yourself, yeah, if you want to hear about other ones coming up. Um, we also have a website at roe.ac.uk slash bc. Um, ev events and uh, various other things, hopefully when we reopen properly, will be kind of up on there. Uh, we have a mailing list and also uh, if you missed some of this or if you, you know, went had your tea or whatever, um, this will be up on the STFC YouTube channel, which I think the link 
will be going into the chat right about now. Um, so if you want to, if you want to see the recording, if you want to share it with somebody else or whatever, um, yeah, the recording will be on the YouTube channel, I believe. Um, thank you all so much. I I hope you've had fun. Um, I certainly did, and have a lovely evening. Bye.